The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hi right, guys, welcome back to another seminar talk here at Carnegie Mellon University. We're super excited today to have Jonathan Katz. He is a principal product manager at Amazon working on Postgres stuff, and he's a core team member and a major contributor for Postgres, so he definitely knows the internals of Postgres. Uh, the reason why we're here, he's here because we want him to talk about PG Vector, where he's the number one, no, sorry, the number two committer uh, on the PG Vector project with a, with a staggering four commits. So uh, as always, as Jonathan gives his talk, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and feel free to interrupt at any time. That way he's not talking to himself for an hour on Zoom. And with that, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Yep, thank you, Andy. So, and for the record, I'm very proud to be number two for PG Vector because Andrew Kane has done such an excellent job. You know, and again, I'm looking for people to like surpass me. You know, in terms of internals, are people who know the Postgres internals way more than me. So, the first thing I do want to thank Andy for like this wonderful title of this talk because this is not the you know the, the title actually had given the talk. But I'm like, okay, whatever, I'll go with it. It sounds it sounds catchy, and you know, I know Andy's very good at things like that. But what's really exciting about PG Vector is if you asked me a year ago what PG Vector was, I probably would have said, what are you talking about? PG Vector. And then I'd be like, why do you need an extension to store vectors in Postgres? So, you know, the world has really changed a lot in the past year, particularly with, you know, the rise of generative AI, these large language models and, and these very big systems. And then the need to actually be able to store, you know, output from these systems and being able to query them, you know, you know quite often in rapid succession. And a lot of what's powerful about Postgres is the ability to extend it and add more functionality to it, such as what PG Vector does. And maybe that's like a good way to, um, you know, dive into you know what we'll talk about today, which is really an overview of PG Vector and the hook being how far it's coming, you know, even in just six months. But first, you know, let's understand like why do we need these systems? You know, I did look at a lot of the talks, you know, that have been given during this seminar, and I think you know a lot of them have covered AI, but. I'd like to at least set the ground for, you know, why is this important, you know, for, you know, you know, for databases. And then, you know, why is Postgres a vector store? You know, Postgres, you think relational database, I'm just doing select star from, you know, pulling up some, you know, integers or, you know, some random text that I stored. Why do I want to run vector queries in it? And then we'll dive, you know, once we understand, oh, gee, like this is, this can be a very good idea. We're going to dive into PG vector, understand what it does and, you know, all sorts of, you know, strategies around using it as well as discussing you know, to a degree how the internals work. And then looking ahead at the roadmap, because I think there's a lot of exciting things going on. So let's dive in, very high level overview. And I think you know, a lot of the excitement around today is that, let's say you have a product. When I was designing this product, I was actually in my in-laws house in Florida, and I was in this like very, you know, I was in the sunroom, which is you know, very Florida themed. And I figured like, okay, let's say I have a store. I have a bunch of like products in the store that are around like, you know, ceramic alligators and, and whatnot. And I want to create this immersive experience where someone comes in and they're asking questions and they can get guided to the correct product. So, you know, that's great. You know, we've seen, you know, we definitely like, you know, seen this, you know, occur with a lot of the you know, advances in generative AI over the past year, but how do we actually do that? Like, how do we take that text information, like all this data you have in your database and turn it into this application where you could be interacting with it in real time. And, you know, what sets the stage here are these things called foundational models. So again, just to like level set everything, you know, a foundational model is basically this, you know, the way I describe it, it's like this very large, you know, machine learning AI system that has trained itself on vast amounts of data. I mean, it could be as big as the internet, which, you know, last I checked has a lot of data. And it's able to, you know, look at all this data and build out models where that if you're able to like ask them a question in, in a natural language, it can produce a natural language response. It's looked over, you know, a vast array of data, but the data is often publicly available. And if you have data that's specific, let's say to your business, to your organization, there's a chance that the foundational model has not looked at it. So in the case of my Florida theme product catalog, you know, it might not have access to you know, this information I've kept in my Postgres database that I've been storing you know, completely disconnected from the internet. But that data can still be useful to query. And this is where a technique called retrieval augmented generation comes in. Retrieval aug augmented generation, or RAG, is a way to be able to add additional in context to a foundational model and you know, provide it with information that it might not necessarily have. In this case, my you know, Florida repertoire. So the idea is that you know, normally, let's say you take you know, standard foundational model, 
you ask the question like how much does a blue elephant vase cost it's probably going to answer like i don't know because you know i don't sell you know blue elephant vases you know i've looked at everything on wikipedia i can ask you i can answer any question on wikipedia but you know not something that's you know transactional in nature like that so the idea with rack is that you might have a knowledge base. You know, in this case, we're going to talk about Postgres. You have, you know, all your product information in Postgres. You know, it contains your catalog, the inventory, the pricing data. So that when a request comes in to say, like, hey, how much does a blue elephant vase cost? The foundational model, you, you augment the response to the foundational model with, oh, a blue elephant vase costs about $20. And it's able to return that. And that's really cool because basically, I mean, there, there's a couple of things going on here. One, it extends what a foundational model can answer. But two, you can use the information that's already in your database to get that. So the next question is, great, how do I combine the two? How do I take the information in my database to be able to augment these foundational models? And you know, the answer therein lies with something called a vector embedding. Now, again, I would first you know, just pause and say, you know, from an academic perspective, there's many ways to do this. But you know, us being database folks, we typically want to try the most efficient way of doing it. And a vector is a very is a very effective way of doing this. So vectors, you know, you know, you know, give me first a flashback to taking real analysis back in college, um, which somehow I did a year of, and I loved it. But I mean, it's really, you know, for me, it was like understanding you know, how do things work in n-dimensional space, and that's exactly what a vector is: is that it's a mathematical representation of your data. In the case of foundational models, generative AI. The idea is that you take you know, some kind of information, it could be a text chunk, it could be an image, it could be a video, you put it into your, your foundational model or your embeddings generator, and what you get is you get this mathematical representation as a vector. You know, the way I describe it is that's the magic of the, the machine learning algorithm. And I think you know, to describe how that all works is you know, likely a, a seminar in itself. But the idea is that we're able, by, by doing this, we're able to create like a common way of representing the information that we can plug either into other foundational models or use to query against other databases to be able to, to have this work in a retrieval augmented generated system. So a brief overview, you know, how, you know, how this is actually used in action. So the one typical workflow is like, let's say I have a bunch of PDF documents. And let's say in this case, you know, in our Florida theme store, we have a bunch of PDF documents about, you know, all the different products that we have. We upload them. First, we need to chunk the documents. The way the embedding uh, embeddings generators work, or uh, the vector embeddings generators work, is that they take you know whatever text you have, you, you're able to give it a certain amount of tokens, um, you know words, you know whatnot, and it's able to turn that into that you know vector into that vectorized structure. So you put it into embeddings model. In this case, you know I use you know the the Amazon tidying embeddings model. And you can store it in a database. You know, in this example, I have a an Aurora Postgres database. So that's part one for enabling RAG is that you take your raw text data, you turn it into vectors, and you store it in a database next to text chunks that you use to uh, augment the model. The next step is that you have a user. Your user comes into your Florida theme store, you know, looking to buy a, a blue elephant vase. So first they ask a question: How much does a blue elephant vase cost? Well, you need to generate an embedding of that question and then use that to query against your database. And that's where the vector is gonna come in. So you're gonna take the, the vector that comes to that embedding model, perform a nearest neighbor query, which we're gonna talk extensively about, and it's gonna give back an answer. And then once you have that answer, that's gonna be the additional context you can give to the question to your large language model. And your large language model is then able to generate an answer with the additional context and say, your elephant vase costs $20. So it's a it's a fairly straightforward workflow, and yet it's very powerful because basically you're able to apply additional knowledge to these large language models through using this very basic data type, the vector. I mean, that's what's so fascinating too, that a lot of this workflow is enabled by doing a vector search or just using a vector, which is something you learn in an introductory computer science course. And yet I call this, I call vectors a nasty data type because even though they're so simple on so many levels, you know, trying to work with them, you know, particularly at scale presents many challenges. The first thing that we need to note is that it takes time to generate vector embeddings. If, if you have a text chunk and you need to generate a vector embedding, you know, every single time it has to process it through the machine learning algorithm, and that takes time. So you can't, if you have a, let's say you have a product catalog, there's 10,000 products. For every single query, you can't generate the embeddings for all 10,000 products all at once. You need to store that data somewhere. And that begets the need for a, a vector database. Okay, let's say we're able to store all of that. Well, one of the problems is the size of these embeddings. 
when I was in college, if you had a 20 dimensional vector for a machine learning system, that was, that was a very large, uh, a very large vector. And today, like it blows my mind. Like I look at some of these LLMs. I mean, the, the standard science seems to be you know, around, you know, 1536 dimensions today, but you know, there's some that are even larger. And can I, it just blows my mind. Like I, I can, I still can't even comprehend what a 20 dimensional vector is. And like here we're talking about like 1500 dimensional vectors, like they're, you know, they're, they're going out of style, but Let's, you know, let, let's go a little bit further. So 1500 dimensions of four byte floats is six kilobytes. And that's quite a bit of data that you're, you know, that you have to store here. So imagine you're storing 10,000 of these, you know, that's, um, that's a lot. And I think, you know, a million of these, you know, I calculate are 5.7 gigabytes. And that's just the raw storage of this information. So a million records, which is not even that much in a, in a table, but well, these 1500 dimensional vectors are 5.7 gigabytes and this before you even think about any indexing. So there's a storage problem here. Now, when you think, when you start thinking storage problems, you start thinking compression. Like, okay, you know, I know, I, I you know, I'll store this text in my database, but it's okay, I'll compress it down or I can store it out of line in Postgres with, you know, with toast tables. But this data doesn't compress really well because think about it, you have a series of random floating point numbers within a vector. And it's completely random. Like you don't necessarily know what they are. There's no rhyme or reason or pattern to it. So they don't really compress. In fact, uh, when I was doing some benchmarking against uh, one of the PG vector indexes and you know, really looking into you know, areas we could you know, try to get what's called some micro optimizations, I actually watched Toast try to compress the vectors. And in the end, it kept coming up with larger values because you couldn't really compress the data and you're basically paying for the overhead of the, the, the header to be able to compress the information. So, all right, so it takes a while to generate the embeddings. They're very large, you can't compress them. I mean, it must get better, right? Well, you know, maybe, maybe you can query them quickly, but you know, forgive the, you know, the million records staying here and here. The, the key operation when you're comparing uh, vectors is you wanna find the distance between them. And you know, we'll talk extensively about that, but there's no shortcuts to it. If you're calculating the distance between two vectors, you have to calculate it for every single dimension. And you can see how long it took me to click through eight, eight of these dimensions. So imagine having to go through you know, 1536 dimensions. And granted, you know, CPUs, GPUs are way faster than I can ever click a, a PowerPoint presentation. But if you have to do that a million times against a million records within your database, it's gonna take some time. It's, a, you know, it's an Owen squared problem. So the, you know, the recap, there's a lot of challenges just working with vector data. You know, I think, you know, <laughs> The one reason I find it so fascinating is because like it's so simple yet it's so challenging and in given you know the prevalence of this this information out there and the need to be able to retrieve it you know very efficiently, we need to find strategies to be able to query them more quickly. The good news is for the past twenty years, folks have been you know folks way smarter than me I, I will add have been working on strategies to do this and they developed this idea of approximate nearest neighbor. So the typical vector query is exact nearest neighbor that. You know, let's say I want to find the 10 closest coffee shops to me. You know, that's 10 nearest neighbors. Now, if I'm using a geospatial application, I probably want to find those exactly because I don't want to, to you know, find out like the, the closest coffee shop to me is in, you know, Pittsburgh, not New York. Approximate nearest neighbor can work in applications, you know, such as, you know, for retrieval augmented generation where you need an answer that's good enough. It may not be exact, but you know, it's gonna give you a good enough answer. So I'll be able to find a good enough, uh, you know, blue elephant vase for my, my Florida collection. So the idea is that, you know, the reason why it's approximate is that in order to do exact nearest neighbor, you have to search every single vector in, in your data set. Approximate nearest neighbor, you're trying to get the best answers without having to search for everything. So the idea is that you're looking over a reduced data set, but more likely than not, you're getting the vectors that you want to, that you want to see. The nice thing is that this should be faster than exact nearest neighbor. You know, it's much faster to look at say like a thousand vectors than a million vectors. And that's gonna be able to give you more efficient results. So on paper, this sounds really good, but the key trade-off this is thing called recall. Recall is a measurement of expected results. And as soon as you get to approximate nearest neighbor, you basically need to, you, you're basically having the trade-off of faster searches, but you may not be able to see all the best results. The way I like to think about recall is, let's go back to that 10 nearest neighbor query. Like I wanna find the 10 closest coffee shops close, you know, ne nearby to me. Depending on my algorithm, let's say I only return eight of the, you know, eight close coffee shops and two close tea shops for lack of a better comparison. 
in this case, this is going to be 80% recall that I mean, I was expecting to see 10 results that were that were matching my preference. I only saw eight of them. And again, this might be good enough because I might find like the, you know, eight of, you know, eight of the closest coffee shops to me, and I'm going to be perfectly happy with that answer. But there's a risk that I'm going to get an answer that's not favorable to, to what I'm looking for. Now, so keep in mind, the trade-off is that I, you know, I probably visited a lot less data in my database than had I you know, decided to do an exact nearest neighbor search, but I might not have gotten all the desired results. And I'm hammering on that point because this is going to be the big trade-off when we look at all the different algorithms on, you know, within PG Vector and just in general with vector similarity search is that I, I need to choose, do I want my data quickly? I don't want my data, you know, in the way, you know, I don't want to say accurately because machine learning folks, you know, give me death stares when I call it accuracy, but to the user, it is accuracy. Like, do I want the results that best suit my search queries? One last thing before we dive into PG Vector, you know, something I've been staring at, you know, with my with my app developer hat on, and maybe, you know, Andy, maybe the fake background you could have given it was that once upon a time I was an app developer, which was true, but you know, I've you know converted very far away from that over the past several years. But you know, we, you know, we like to always think about things like the high end. Like, how do I look at things? You know, I, you know, how do I get things as quickly as possible? But when I'm an app developer, I need to consider like, what do I want to do for ultimately, you know, using data in my application? In this case, vectors. And the first thing is storage. You know, do I do I need my results as quickly as possible? Do I want to be able to keep them in memory, or do I have so many results that like I can't, you know, pay for you know enough memory in my system that I need to keep them, you know, down at the storage layer? Because once I understand that, I might understand my performance. That sure, I want I want to get the car that goes as quickly as possible, but I may not be willing to pay for that car that goes as quickly as possible. You know, you know, skipping ahead to like the cost parameter, and also in this case, there's a new there's a new thing, and this is like really weird for database people. It's like this you know this idea of relevancy because you know from the relational database world, when you write a query, of course you get the exact results back. Like why you know why would you ever why would you ever not expect to get that? And I can tell you personally, like when I started playing with PG Vector, like approximate nearest neighbor was weird to me. Like I was getting results back, you know, I, I like, you know, poor you know, recall settings. I was getting results back that like made zero sense to me. And I'm like, what's going on? And it's this notion that you do need to consider relevancy into your results. The thing is like all these things are intention that you need to figure out, you know, what matters the most to you. And again, you can like take this box and you can build it out and say like, everything matters to me. I'm gonna pay for storage and performance and maximum relevancy, but likely what's gonna happen is that you're going to have to pick and choose. That relevancy may be more important to you, but you know it's gonna come at it's gonna come at hit to performance and might end up costing you more, you know, based upon the system that you run. So you know a lot of these are the practical considerations about vector storage. Now I want to get into you know you know one of my favorite parts of this, which is talk about Postgres as a vector store. And again, to me, you know I you know I'll say that you know. You know, a vector ultimately is a data type, which means that you can basically put a vector in anything that has, you know, a storage processing system. And, you know, this is true of Postgres. And, you know, one, the first question might be, well, okay, well, why Postgres? Um, for one, it's open source. You know, Postgres has been around for over 35 years. Actually, you know, Postgres and I are about the, the same age at, you know, you know, the ripe old age of 37. And, it's not controlled by a single company. Now, this is, you know, one thing that's had Postgres become very popular through the years is that, you know, it's very community driven. I mean, even today, you know, I was involved with a lot of different, you know, community projects and community work where it's not a single person making decision. It's, you know, folks coming together and, you know, coming towards a consensus on what the best design for, you know, something, it, you know, might be. But through the years, and, you know, you know, I was fortunate to, you know, really observe this, you know, particularly first as a Postgres user, and then, you know, Postgres contributor, Abbey now on the coding side, is the growth of Postgres. You know, having the features, you know, in Postgres that helped it to be adopted, you know, as widely as it is today. I mean, and I would actually say it starts in the app developer. Just the data type support and the implementations of it just make it so much easier to build applications. One of my favorite data types is the range type. Um, you know, once upon a time, I was at a company where the principal thing we did was scheduling and being able to keep, you know, store a range of times within a database and retrieve those very quickly was, was huge. It made it so much, sim you know, so much simpler to be able to, to manipulate that kind of data. And that comes in the indexing support as well, that, I, you know, in the case of the range type, I could do overlap queries and have them, you know, returned in, you know, sub, you know, sub millisecond time, as opposed to having to, you know, concoct, you know, my own custom indexing system. 
And, you know, these features through the years from Postgres, you know, have made it easier to run it, you know, both for small and large workloads, you know, which has certainly helped with the adoption. But the question becomes, you know, well, why vectors? You know, why now? And I think, you know, the, la the last piece that you know, is missing on the slide is the, the extensibility of Postgres, that if something's not there, you can add it. And one way folks have added things to Postgres through the years is forking it and creating their own database system. But even if they don't fork it, Postgres itself was designed to be extensible back from the original original Berkeley design. So if you don't like it, you can you know add the feature and package it as an extension, and then you know have it consumed by you know people on you know all sorts of different Postgres. So that's the first thing. It's like why use Postgres for vector searches? Well, it's there. You can you know there is an extension for it. There's PG Vector, but you know, if you look at it from a developer perspective, I can just add in, I can just add in PG Vector and I don't need to do any additional work really. It's, you know, it works with my existing tooling, works with my existing drivers. There's some, some there are some extensions to the existing drivers that can make it more efficient, you know, such as being able to support the binary vector format for, for PG Vector. But the idea is that I don't have to do much more work to be able to support in my application. Um, from a practical standpoint, it might make sense to co-locate my data in the same database. So I have my you know, transactional oriented data and I have my machine learning data you know, within the same database. That allows me to use you know, one of my personal favorite features of Postgres, which is the join. Um, but you know, it might also make sense just based upon you know, how my application is interfacing with the database. And meanwhile, you know, Postgres, you know, this isn't like a, you know, a you know, one and done type thing is that you can work with other systems that uh, process data upstream, downstream and have Postgres either in the center or you know, as part of that transaction. Um, because Postgres is the transactional store. You might decide, you know, based upon your requirements that you do need a you know, completely in-memory vector processing system, but you still want to have a place to store your vectors at the end of the day. And, you know, maybe you don't need a, a vector index on top of it, but Postgres can be there so you can, you know, load all of your vector data back into your in-memory system. You know, if there's one thing Postgres has been very good at through the years, it's storing data and, you know, being a reliable store for that. So you said something about like the, there's certain client drivers that can operate on vectors more efficiently. Is that what you said? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give an example. Um, so Postgres is the JDBC driver. So it's the way they can connect Java apps directly to Postgres. And if you go to the PG Vector repo, there's actually uh, I, I probably call it an extension of the JDBC driver that allows you to take the vector stored natively in Java and transmit over the wire to, to Postgres in a binary format. So instead of having to go from something like binary to text to binary, you can keep it you know, directly in the binary format and, and save a transformation. Got it, okay, thanks. Yeah. So, and I think that's actually a good segue into what is PG Vector, since uh, you know, we've, been, you know, we've been talking about it, but we haven't defined it yet. Um, quite simply, it's an open source extension that allows you to do vector storage and search. And, you know, some of this is, you know, I'd say product phrasing around what it does, but it does really break down to like what it is at its core. And what I really like about PG Vector is that it is very simple. And that's actually what the ethos of the project, that it's a vector data type. That's really all it is for. It's for, you know, being able to store and process vector data. But that's the key, that you also need to be able to search over it. And this is where the bulk of our talk is going to be for, for the rest of the day is that, you know, the indexing and searching over it. Um, you know, there's two index types supported. We're gonna get to know them very well. There's IVF flat and HNSW. IVF flat is a, a cluster-based approach towards indexing. HNSW is a graph-based approach. They both are, you know, they both have uh, characteristics that are, you know, they both have characteristics that are trade-offs. But again, we'll we'll talk all about that. Searching, um, you know, for good news for the database folks is that this does support exact nearest neighbor searches in Postgres. Uh, it also supports approximate nearest neighbor searches. And, you know, the, again, like the whole, I, I tell you personally, it took me a while to wrap my head around how all of that worked. I also just pause here too, is that Postgres actually has supported vector searches for a long time, actually going back to the Berkeley days and supporting exact nearest neighbor searches. Um, Postgres has the array data type. And with the array data type, you can you can define a distance operation and be able to find effectively all the uh, all the arrays that are closest to you. It just doesn't have indexing support. The cube data type does have indexing support and supports up to 100 dimensions, which when I was implemented, I think back in 2000, 2001, again, like 100, who, who needed more than 100 dimensions for a vector? Um, and it uses the gist index for it. And you can actually do an efficient uh, k-nearest neighbor gist search 
for you know everything that's around you. But I actually I actually stared at the cube data type quite a bit before embarking on the PG vector journey. And to be able to extend beyond uh, 100 dimensions would take some work. And and again, you know, as we'll see, there's reasons why. Uh, I also say I personally played around with GIST and trying to see how far we could take GIST for doing these types of searches. And it is a, a very exhaustive process to, to be able to enable uh, KNN with GIST. So probably a, a much longer discussion for a separate talk. Uh, metadata, so you can co-locate information with your vector embeddings. It could be text chunks. It could be you know, your entire you know, product management system. And the nice thing is that there's a choice of distance operators. Um, you know, this it uses the secret Postgres code for distance, which is you know the you know various uh, Star Wars type uh, you know fighters. But the the two most popular ones are the the one on the left and the one in the center, uh, which is the Euclidean distance and the cosine distance. And what does that actually mean? So here's a chart. I'm actually really excited to test out with this group because I've been trying to explain like how the different distance operations work. And typically, you know, what I do is. You know, I have I often have some props on my desk that my two year old leaves. So in this case, I have a cat today and a red ball. So Euclidean distance is line of sight. It's the idea. It's like how far apart are we? You know, if we're looking at each other. Then there's angular distance, which is or cosine distance, which is angular distance, which in this case is measuring you know the angle between two objects. I guess I have a flashlight too today. The one that I've had the hardest time figuring out to how to visualize is the inner product. And I've actually, I've like, you know, scoured the web for the best way to visualize inner product. And the best I can, the best I've been able to come up with is it's kind of an amalgamation of the properties of both like a line of sight distance and an angular distance. But I've yet to find like a good visualization for, for how this looks. And I'm a little bit concerned what I have here today might end up becoming like visualization. Because, you know, again, like the inner product, you know, back in, back in my college days, like all you did, all you did, and, you know, once you get beyond, you know, elementary calculus is, you know, everything's an inner product in some way, shape or form. But, you know, I, I kind of kicked myself and not like stopping to question, like, how do I visualize this? So this is probably more than I'll ever talk about the inner product, you know, in hopefully my lifetime. But given I had this group here, I was wondering if anyone had like a better way of, you know, of visualizing this. I Probably not, or we just ask ChatGPT. Well, I, again, I've tried it. Like, I get back, I get back, you know, like the, just mathematical answers, or, or like C Euclidean, or you know, cosine distance. Wait, don't ask anything to ChatGPT. They're trying to figure out who runs OpenAI right now. I'll I'll run Stable Diffusion now. I'll see what see what it spits out. Cool. Thank you. I I, pre I appreciate that. Anyway. What's also interesting, so, so the distance operations, by the way, are the foundational portion of being able to do similarity search because you're basically trying to figure out how far apart every, you know, everything is from each other. And once you have that, you're able to start indexing it. Because again, if we try to do an exact nearest neighbor search over a million vectors, let alone 10 million or a billion, it's gonna take a very long time. I've tried it, it can take a very long time. So we need to be able to index it. And what's cool is it's actually important to understand how PG vector indexes a vector because basically it does a normalization of, uh, of your vector. So a normalization is setting your, your, the magnitude of your vector to one. So your magnitude, I always like to think, you know, when, whenever you look at a vector, you see like the, you know, the arrow pointing somewhere and the, the, the wrong thing to say is the magnitude is your length, but you know, it's simply in my head, it's, you know, it's the size of your vector. Um, and you know the you know you know the you know the, the key property of a vector is that you know you have a magnitude and you have a direction of it. If you're able to eliminate the magnitude as uh, as an attribute in your comparisons, then you only have to worry about the direction or you know ultimately the distance between you know you know two or more vectors in space. So that's what PG vector does when it's indexing a vector. It's like first it's going to check if it's a valid vector. So you know, a valid vector you know, has certain properties, but in this case, you know, for the purposes of indexing, uh, it needs to have the same dimensions and needs to have magnitude. So it needs to have magnitude greater than zero. Then it checks if it's normalized. So a normalized vector is a magnitude of one. And again, you know, ultimately mathematically, you could probably, you know, you know, we could set to anything, right? We could say a normalized vector has a magnitude of 10 and then, you know, you know, compute, you know, map all the vectors to magnitude of 10, but, you know, mathematically, we're just gonna set it to one. So we normalize it because what's gonna happen is that ultimately when we're doing our index operations, we're gonna be able to cheat and we're gonna be able to take out some of the calculations we normally need to do in some of the distance operations, which are most notice noticeable in the cosine distance, which has you know, some division operations based upon your magnitude. 
three magnitude is one, you know, you eliminate those operations and, you know, that's, that's less CPU cycles you need to spend. And that's important because if you're, if you have to compare 1536 dimensions, every single time you do a comparison between two vectors, you want to minimize how much time you're spending in the CPU or, or GPU if, you know, if you, if you have that privilege. So this is this is an important con. This is one of the things you might also take for granted too when you're using something like PG Vector is that it's doing this work behind the scenes to make sure that you're able to get the most efficient index searches. Now, PG Vector has two indexing methods, as I mentioned. Uh, IVF flat, which stands for uh, ooh, I probably shouldn't have said that. I know it's like inverted flat index. Um, I know the IVF stands. There's something else in the IVF that I'm blocking right now. And HNSW, which is hierarchical navigable small worlds. Side note, I encourage everyone to read, who's interested in this and getting deep to read the, HNS, the original HNSW paper. It is a well-written paper and it is you know, very fascinating. And we'll make another mention about it later on. So let's compare the two methods. You know, as I mentioned you know, before, IVF flat is k-means space. So the idea is that when you have your vectors in a vector space, it's, you're gonna find a certain number of centers and you're gonna cluster the vectors around you know, one of those centers. HNSW is graph-based where the best way I describe HNSW is that you create like this web of, you know, web of vectors all connected to each other. And based upon how you traverse that web, you're, you're gonna be able to put yourself into a neighborhood that has the most relevant information. And I think, you know, that's the, that's the key of this next bullet point, which I should have fast forwarded to is, you know, this is, this is how you ultimately organize it. IVF flat, it's centers and lists. You, you define how many lists you want, say a hundred lists. And for each vector, you put it into one of those lists. With HNSW, you're going to traverse through the graph until you find vectors that you're most similar to, and you're going to create a bunch of links that connect you to that neighborhood. The idea being that you're positioned in a, in a position in space that is going to be most relevant to like all the other vectors around you. What's interesting is that it, this actually affects how you build these indexes. Because you need to be able to calculate centers in vector space for IVA flat, you need to have data already in the index. You can't start from an empty index. You need, you know, ideally you actually have your index, you know, you, you have your table fully populated and you build your index around all those vectors. You can iterate and add more vectors to an IVA flat index, but you need to have that index already built because those that's how you're going to define your centers. Whereas with HNSW, it's completely iterative. You can start from an empty table, no vectors in your table, and then add them you know, one by one by one, or probably, you know, or if you have a very large data set, like concurrently or in parallel. And you just iteratively build up that graph over time. So that's very interesting too, you know, based upon you know, what you're looking at, but also this gives you some you know, different uh, properties for building out the indexes. And finally, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at insertion time for building the indexes, um, ultimately the insertion time for IVF flat is bounded by the number of lists. So if you have a hundred lists, you're gonna have to check 100 lists to determine which list you go in. If you have 1,000 lists, you have to check 1,000 lists, 10,000 lists, et cetera. So the insertion time on IVF flat can be very quick, but it's gonna scale up as the number of lists grows. Whereas with HNSW, uh, the insertion time increases as the graph increases, you know, kind of similar to what you might see with the B-tree index, albeit you're, you're probably doing some more computations than you know, being within a B-tree index. So there's different bounding properties. You know, IVF flats can be fixed by the number of lists. That's going to affect your insertion time. HNSW is just going to grow as your overall index grows. So, which method should you choose? You know, this is you know you'll probably answer this more as we dive deeper. But if you need, the first thing is that if you just need your exact nearest neighbors, uh, you don't build an index. You don't use an index. You're going to compute this just against you know doing sequential scan of your data. And remember, this is that tension we see between performance and relevancy. If you need 100% relevancy, if you can't miss any results, don't use an approximate nearest neighbor index. If your domain requires building indexes very quickly, you're going to want to use IVF flat because most of the work in doing the index is you know, done up front is that you, know, you have to build the index all at once, identify the centers, and then it's very easy to add data to the centers. Um, IVF flat we'll see also has some very nice parallelization today in, uh, in PG vector. If you want an index that's easy to manage, um, I like to call it set and forget, um, you have HNSW. Uh, the nice thing about HNSW is that the, I'd say the, today the defaults in PG vector are pretty, are pretty good. Um, they were well tested and you might need to tweak them you know, in terms of building the index, but generally it's very, you know, it, you know, it's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, with IVF flat, there's more tuning you need to do both from the build, uh, the build portion and the query portion. 
into the stubby, I don't want to say it's set and forget, like all these, all these different mixes require tuning, but it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit easier to tune. And if you're looking for high query performance, you know, and recall, or basically a very nice performance to recall ratio, then go with h &S w because that, that's really where it's excelling right now is that you're going to spend more, much more time building the index than IVF flat. But uh, when you flip it around, you look at query performance, you know, particularly query performance and recall, h &S w has been, you know, has been you know, one of the, the leading algorithms in its class. So from here on out, we're going to deep dive, and I'm just trying to be cognizant of time. Um, are there any questions so far? I think you're good. Cool. All right. So I think the best, you know, the, the way I like to do this deep dive is going to the, you know, the best practices, because through the best practices, we, we need to explore how these things work. And the first thing to keep in mind is actually storage. Like, how do you store these vectors within Postgres? An important aspect here is toast. Um, the oversized attribute storage technique. Po everything in Postgres is bound by uh, the eight kilobyte page size, or I should say anything that's bounded, you know, every everything in Postgres for storing is bounded by the eight kilobyte page size so long as you haven't forked it or, you know, recompiled it to, to modify the page size. So if you have a value that exceeds, you know, eight kilobytes, you're going to have to store it out of line. And that's what the, the Toast system does is that it's able, it's basically a table that's separate from your heap table and it's able to keep pages that extend, you know, beyond that eight kilobyte limit. The really by default Postgres starts toasting values over two kilobytes. Um, and if you have a 1536 dimensional vector, Postgres is going to toast that. And what's interesting is that, you know, this does, you know, this will ultimately affect performance in some way. You know, what's good is that, um, you know, Postgres, a lot of things, you know, most things in Postgres are configurable and, you know, and how you store your data in the column, you know, you, you can, you can select that. What's interesting is you can't do that at create table time. You have to do an alter table command to be able to set the storage. And that that's something I might bring up to the list as I, uh, as I say that out loud. The two to keep in mind here today are, actually the three to keep in mind are the first thing, plain extended external. Um, currently the default in PG vector is to use extended, where both you, you store your data out of line once, in, once it exceeds the toast threshold and you try to compress it. But as we know, uh, we can't compress these vectors. You know, I've tried. Uh, I believe PG Vector is actually going to shift to uh, using external in the 060 release. So it's a, it's a default for now, but it's going it's to shift to external. The other is to use plain. Plain is where the data is stored in line with the table. So instead of storing your you know six kilobyte vector out of line, you know in the toast table, it's in the you know you store it in the heap table. Now, why does this all matter? You know, typically, you know, one of the thought processes behind Toast is that when you're storing this large data in Postgres, it's probably not on the hot path of your query. You know, it, you know, originally it was, you know, I well, I, I probably should know how it, you know, originated because I've talked to Jan Weck about this. But, you know, you think about it, like you're storing these large text blobs, you're probably not querying into them all that often. Or if you are, like, it's going to be, it's not going to be in an index, right? It's going to be you know, you have an index that's going to reduce your data set down to something, you know, relatively small, and you're doing probably some pattern matching on the query, or you're just going to be searching like everything anyway, but it's going to be a fairly infrequent query. So it's okay to store it out of line because it's not on the hot path, but your 1500 dimensional vector is in the hot path. Like you are actually, you know, performing those distance operations on it. So we have to make a jump to another table. The other thing is that, you know, the Postgres planner, you know, did not necessarily conceive of a world where you're querying over very large data that's you know outside of your hot path. So let's take you know for example you know 120 dimensional vector. So this is going to be stored in line in your heap table, and we're going to do a sequential scan on it, and we can see that the post that Postgres is planning you know six parallel workers in this case for for querying all this data. Cool. So let's do the same thing on a 1500 dimensional vector. And again, I don't expect you to, you know, be, you know, paying attention to like all the costing numbers in there because actually that's the key to it. But notice how for like the same exact query, 1500 dimensional vector, only four workers are planned, four parallel workers for, you know, the exact same number of rows of data. And it's because when Postgres is doing its estimate, it's not considering the toast pages that, you know, in, you know, in this query, even though like the, to you know, th these toasted values are the most important part of this query as I'm doing this scan. Um, I've actually raised this on the list. It's something that uh, I, I'm going to try to push a little bit more for us to be better about. But you know, the idea is that you know, an area where Postgres can improve is that if you know, if it knows that 
there's data that's in the hot path that is in toast that needs to be considered that it should be able to get better and better costing estimates for it. And you can see if you look very closely, uh, the cost is higher for the, you know, the smaller vectors than the, than the larger vectors. So by the way, this is this is one of those gotchas that you know that you can run into, you know, particularly you know when you're working with this data. So there are some strategies. First, uh, you can use plain storage, which again you have to run an alter table you know statement on it. Um, the one drawback with plain storage is that it limits your vector sizes to two thousand dimensions, which is probably okay for like most of the workloads I've been seeing. Um, I have heard of some legitimate use cases with vectors going beyond two thousand dimensions, so. You know, it is something that you know certainly uh, we can get better at all around. We'll we'll talk a bit about that later later in this talk. There's also a, a Postgres parameter, min parallel table scan size, where you can induce more parallel workers, and that's exactly what I did on this uh, 1500 dimensional vector query. Is that I set min parallel table scan size to one, and now I have 11 workers, which makes a lot more sense because I have you know way more you know th th these are taking up full pages basically, and there's going to be way more pages to scan. Versus the 128 dimensional vector, which you know everything's going to be you know squashed down to you know it, you don't need to scan as many pages. John, so that's one Can I yeah. ask a question? Uh, yeah, go I, for it. Uh, this is Jignesh Patel, Andy's colleague. Hey, so a lot of things that you're talking about kind of make you know this this debate about whether vectors and relational databases mix. The rag example that you gave is very much about getting a very low latency search on vectors going. So I don't know if you're going to hit that in the talk. Uh, yeah. I know it does make sense to go and pack some of this together, but is it even practical? Because the latency to just get anything out of Postgres is pretty high and asking for a friend who has tried. No, uh, my startup has tried. And, you know, we ended up going down a different way because it was just the latency was very hard to meet on anything that's even reasonably large. Let me, let me jump to the end. Because I, I say on my slides I have left, so I want to jump to the end. So here's an example, um, I'd say a fairly, un, maybe not an unoptimized example, but, and you know, this is QPS numbers, not latency numbers, but these were, ooh, I think it's 10 million 1500 dimensional vectors. And, you know, in this case, you know, I was trying to compare, you know, running them on different hardware, but you can see, you know, if you look at, if you look closely at the transaction per second numbers, you can see the performance I'm getting, being able to, you know, get, you know, the kinds of vectors out of RAG systems, you know, from Postgres. And the key, you know, this is where the algorithm is you know, most important. Um, one of my friends and colleagues, Peter Gagan, you know, says it best, you know, it's all about the algorithm and how you implement the algorithm. That's where you can get the most performance gain. And this is where, to go back to the talk that, uh, the talk title Andy gave me, this is where HNSW, you know, is very powerful. You're going to pay, you know, where you have to pay is you have to pay on the indexing, which, you know, you know we'll get to, but, the you know the trade-off is that you're able to get these very low latency queries. One thing Postgres, you know, as you mentioned, you know, you know, I I, I don't want to necessarily say there's a misconception that you know Postgres you know, has higher latency than other systems. I think it depends on what you're doing. But one thing that Postgres does very well is looking up things from indexing, particularly things that are tree-like, you know, like you know, kind of like a B tree. But HNSW has similar properties to a B tree in the sense that you know it is you know. You know, it goes a little bit beyond that. It's you know, it's a graph, but the idea is it's a graph where you're going through a minimal set of information to be able to get you know the maximum you know the maximum amount of data out of it. No, so, I think that makes sense. Do have you done benchmarking against something that's specialized that you know, like a quadrant or uh, any of these other engines? I think that's would be super interesting, and maybe that's part of future work, uh, and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would say uh, I'd say I'm not the best person to answer that question at this time. Um, I've definitely seen I've you know, I've definitely run my own benchmarks, and what I've seen is that you know Postgres is you know has been able you to be very favorable, particularly you know with uh, HNSW uh, HNSW implementation. And just like being cognizant of the time, I say I have 15 minutes left. You know, maybe maybe uh, you know I do want to skip ahead and you know not spend too much time on uh, on exact nearest neighbor search. So you know, let's get to the you know the fast stuff. Um, so I do want, I do want to talk about IVF flat really quickly. Um, and you know, as mentioned, you know, it's a clustering algorithm. So the idea is that you have, you know, let's say if you're a bunch of vectors in space, you define, you know, you basically say how many lists you want. Those are gonna be your centers. Say I want three lists. And then, you know, going through the k-means process, you're gonna be able to find your clusters and you know, and you know, this builds out your index. The nice thing about you know, IVF flat, there's only two parameters you need to worry about. is the number of lists 
which is, you know, good to find how you build the index, and then the number of probes, which is how many of these lists do you visit during the query? The idea being that the fewer lists that you have to visit, the faster your query is going to be. So the idea is that, you know, let's say we try to, you know, query just one list, um, that's gonna be very fast. We find like, okay, this is the list I'm closest to, and then find me the three, you know, the three vectors I'm closest to. Um, and note to self, I need to change the highlight on this because that might not have been clear. But these might not actually be the three closest vectors because if you eyeball this, um, I see there's a vector that I'm closer to in, you know, in the list that's not highlighted. And this is again where recall is important because you know, you, you, or, or relevancy is important because I can get a very fast query here, but I might not get all the results that I want. I just, just also another misnomer with IVF flat. I think a lot of people see that IVF flat is slow. IVF flat can actually be super fast based upon how you define your list, but you run a risk of relevancy when you, if you, if you have lists that are too small. And that's what we see here, because if I go to two lists, I actually see I'm closest to these three vectors. And, you know, that's why, you know, that's why that probe value, you know, is so important. Um, just briefly about IVF flat, you know, the, the key thing about IVF flat is defining your list. Um, that is, you know, that's ultimately how you can be able to tailor your recall to it, at least in a way where you can minimize your number of probes. Um, there's some guidance, um, you know, th there's some guidance in the PG in the PG vector repo for how to you know, choose the number of lists. General rule of thumb you know, is right there, you know, less than a million number of vectors divided by a thousand, otherwise square root. Um, what is nice about IVF flat is that it is you know, it is actually very easy to parallelize. And, you know, through that, and actually through leveraging some things in Postgres, you can build these indexes very quickly, particularly if you're getting, you know, the recall that you want. The other thing I'll mention about recall is that it can often be driven by your, you know, the algorithm you're using to vectorize your data. So it's not just, it's not just your indexing algorithm, it's also the, you know, whatever upstream system you're using. IV flat, the data can also skew over time. Um, if you, um, you might need to rebuild and recalculate your centers based upon you know how the data gets added and if it's you know particularly skewing the results that you want. Just real quick, uh, parallelism in uh, IVF flat. You know when we were looking at IVF flat and seeing you know where we can improve the build time, we noticed that uh, basically we were doing a sequential scan. Like once we defined our list, you know we were basically pulling every vector out one by one and then assigning it to its appropriate list. Which you know, if you have ten million vectors, will take some time. But what's cool is Postgres has the ability to do parallel scans, so you can read data out in parallel and then assign it to its appropriate list, and then uh, you know, and then you're good to go. And we saw that this was a huge improvement. Um, at the most, you know, we, we saw index uh, build speeds increase by up to four x. Um, in this random example that I did, I was only able to get two x. Uh, I think it was a little bit of a smaller. It was a smaller data set, only one million vectors, because I rushed this one. But this is pretty cool, and it didn't impact. It, you know, it didn't impact recall at all. It just basically made it much faster to to build the IVF flat indexes. Um, parallel builds are re, uh, in PG vector zero five and, and greater. And if you if you're using IVF flat indexes, you know it's definitely it definitely helps us speeding up the the testing of your systems. Um, the you know the, I mean the other thing I think you know the main the main lever you have in IVF flat is the probes. Um, that does increase your recall. It will impact performance. Uh, there's some other things too, just to keep in mind. You know, based upon you know what we discussed about Toast. Toast definitely had a big impact. Uh, on IVF flat queries, and it took a while to get the costing correct for them. We don't see Toast having impact on HNSW as much, you know, which we're about to dive into. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of these recommendations are more specific to IVF flat. Um, the one that's universal to both is shared buffers. Um, the more, the more of your data you can keep in memory, the faster your queries will be. I mean, I think that's in general for. Uh, for most systems, but you know that is you know that's something to keep in mind you know as you're dealing with this data and you know the particular toxicity with vector data is that it tends to be very large. So let's get into HNSW. HNSW does take a little bit more work to build, both you know because it has one additional parameter IVF flat, and that the indexing time takes a little bit longer. But the payoff you you know basically what you pay in the indexing time you're, you're going to make back up in the query time and, and perhaps you know in a greater way. Uh, the two key parameters are M, which is, you know, in your graph, you're building links between other vectors around you. So a higher M means that you have more links to the vectors around you. So you, this is how you create your neighborhoods and your clusters. 
And then E of construction, which is essentially your search radius as you're going through, as you're going through building the vector. The idea is, sorry, is go through building the index. And the idea is that a, a higher E of construction means that you know, you're, you're looking at a greater set of vectors and you're more likely to get you know, better results, meaning better recall. So let's build an HNSW index real quick. And in part, of this is to showcase the work involved in building one. So let's say I have this orange vector. I'm going to, I'm going to go in and I'm going to start building out my index. HNSW works in layers. And the layers go from less dense to a greater density. And the original algorithm actually had a single layer. Um, it's just navigable, uh, small worlds. So there's no hierarchy to it. And the authors discovered that if they're able to break out the hierarchy, if they were able to actually get uh, you know, better recall levels, you know, just from going from a, a sparser space to a denser space. So at the top level, we might just link ourselves to you know, a single vector that's closest to us. We then use that to descend to a lower level where we might start linking to more vectors around us and basically building up a denser tree. So finally we get to you know, the final layer. And at the final layer, that's where we're going to create the neighborhood, like a dense neighborhood of vectors that are around us. Because so ultimately, when we do the search, that is how we're going to we're going to search the graph. Now, in a real you know in a real uh, HNSW index, you might have you know more layers. You'll certainly you might certainly have a lot more vectors than this. But the idea is to give you a sense of how you're traversing. So it takes a little bit of work because you know you are looking for like a local you know that local optimum of all the vectors that are around you. But you're going to create like this tight knit group that is going to allow you to you know do these efficient KNN searches. So this gets into you know querying. And querying, there's only one parameter, uh, EF search, um, and PG vector defaults to 40. The key is that the EF search value has to be greater than greater than or equal to your limit because EF search is essentially how many vectors am I keeping you know in my you know in my search in my search list. So if you have a greater if you have a limit greater than the EF search value, you're going, you know, you're going to miss out on some of the vectors. So how do you query it? Let's say I have this query vector, it's this blue vector, and I'm at the top layer. I'm gonna find the vector that I'm closest to. I'm gonna descend down to the next layer going down that. Then I'm, then I'm gonna go around and try to find a vector that I'm closest to in that graph. I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna descend down to the final layer and I'm gonna see there's all these, well, actually not the final layer yet, I'm almost there. I'm gonna descend down to the next layer. I'm gonna again, find the vector I'm closest to. Descend, you know, descend down to that. And I'm in the final layer, which is going to be, you know, that dense graph that we talked about. And I'm going to find, again, the vector I'm closest to. And that's going to be, you know, that's where I'm going to start building out my, my neighborhood from it. And as you can see, um, you know, through this very quick search is that, you know, the idea is that I'm going to be in the vectors that I'm, you know, closest to, most similar to. But I'm not going to have to do as much work as IVF flat because I'm not list bound. I'm more, you know, dare I say, tree bound. It's will be much similar to traversing, you know, traversing like something like a B tree that I'm used to, where I don't need to touch as many pages to be able to get to the answer that I want. And if I'm able to build these neighborhoods correctly, you know, at least on disk, you know, I'm, you know, I'm also not going to be hopping around as much on disk because I'm, you know, again, I'm in this like dense neighborhood of data that's most similar to me. So we do more upfront work in constructing the index, but the payoff is that we don't have to search as many vectors as we're as we as we're going through it, though, again, I can tune all of that. Like, if I increase EF search, then I, you know, I will be searching more vectors. But based upon you know how well I was able to build the index, I might be able to keep that value relatively low, you know, for the the neighborhood that I'm I'm looking for. The other thing is that you know there's different you know there's different ways of implementing HNSW. Um, FICE, for example, implements version three of the algorithm. At least last I checked, uh, PG vector implements version four of the algorithm. And it has to do, oh, I might mess up the difference between the versions, uh, but it has to do, I believe, with how you're storing the distance within the, uh, you know, within the, the, the index itself. Um, you know, it's a, it's a different optimization. And one thing we noticed when we were testing HNSW against uh, the ANN benchmarks originally was that we were getting higher recall for, you know, the same, the same parameters versus some of the other implementations. And, you know, again, this is the this gets into the performance recall trade off, but you know, choosing the correct algorithm or cho or, or choosing how you implement the algorithm can impact ultimately your recall. Um, the one thing, you know, as I said, you know, a lot a lot one of the nice things about uh, HNSW, at least PG vectors HNSW, is that it can't be set and forget that the defaults seem to work pretty well. We tested these defaults again against the known ANN benchmark data set, and you know, these seem to give 
the best bang for the buck. Um, currently with PG Vector's HNSW implementation, it doesn't support parallel index builds. So we've been recommending starting with an empty index or an empty table and then populating that and using concurrent inserts or concurrent copies to be able to speed up build. So for example, um, I took a million 128 dimensional vectors, which I know that's a small vector these days, but we could see the impact of concurrent inserts on it that we're able to, we're actually able to build the index pretty quickly, you know, put, you know pushing a lot of clients at it and, um, you know, versus, you know, just having the loading, preloading all the data and having a, a single build. We did test that this method does not impact recall. Um, we'd actually, we actually did extensive testing on that, you know, before recommending it, but uh, that's pretty cool. Now, uh, fast forwarding to the end, uh, there actually is going to be parallel build support for PG Vector in 06. I was committed, I believe, about 10 days ago. So, you know, some of this advice may not hold or it may hold. We're actually going to do some comparisons in terms of like when it makes sense to use each method. Choosing uh, M and EF construction too is a little bit of an art in the science, but one of the reasons why we chose the defaults that we did was that we saw like diminishing returns once EF construction was above uh, 64, that you could certainly boost recall, but by not as much of a factor. And it had a, you know, we saw like a, you know, a big impact on a uh, uh, build time. Like, you know, I don't want to say it doubled. That's, I don't think that's fair, but we certainly saw a measured increase on it. So again, it depends ultimately what you want. Um, having a higher EF construction means that you'll be able to get better recall with lower EF search and lower EF search is typically faster queries, you know, part of that slide that we jumped ahead to. But, you know, again, you might have to you might have to test that based upon your based upon your data set. So finally, um, uh, what is this one? Oh, so this is M. So we found that M um, increasing M significantly increased uh, build time, and it definitely did help with recall, particularly for uh, lower values of EF search, but at a great cost. Like we saw a much greater jump in build times when increasing M. So the going advice is if you're trying to boost the recall of your queries, first start with EF construction because the, the indexing time is smaller. And then if you're still not like seeing the results that you, you like, you know, certainly try increasing M. I call this more like the, the pragmatic testing advice versus you know, necessarily anything theoretical, but in part, you know, this is this is why we experiment. Um, so jumping ahead, um, I do want to touch on filtering real quick. Um, so filtering, the idea of filtering is, you know, I have a where clause, can I use the index? The short answer is yes. Um, there are some techniques that you do need to, to use for it. I'm, I'll just jump ahead to that. So first, um, you can use a partial index. So partial index is you define a where on your index clause, and that's one way to do pre-filtering because you're only indexing part of the data. I know Andy is shaking his head. Don't worry, Andy, I, I got you. Yeah, wait, no, no, wait, no, wait this is... No, I was, I was like, I was just thinking like, oh, partial index, of course, yes, it's Postgres, you already have partial indexes. Yeah. You, you don't have to, yeah, it's great. But there's more, so you have partitions too. So you can partition your data if you have that natural partition key and then just build the index on the partition. And I've, I've seen cases with, with users who only need to index a subset of their data. They can have like a default partition and exact nearest neighbor searches are fine there. And then, you know, they can put some indexable data in a partition. There's one more thing coming though, and actually coming very soon. That's already up in the repo, which I'm I, I can't wait till the slide to get to. It. I'm excited about it. But there's a paper proposed called HQANN, um, which the idea is that it's effectively a multi-column index where you have your vector data, and you have your a certain set of attributes, and you're within an HNSW index, but you're basically building appropriate links between vectors that have similar attributes, such that you're able to you know traverse the index based upon those attributes. Um, there's, a, there's a patch for it up in, uh, in PG Vector today in the HQANN branch. And um, I've had uh, some known users testing it and they're seeing you know, really good results. So the idea is that you build you know, effectively a multi-column vector index where again, one column is a vector and you, know, you have you know, a couple of attributes available for your, your, your metadata. It could be something like a category ID. And you, you, again, you can then just like write Oops. you can then just write like a query like this and like, boom, it works. It pre-filters, it uses the index and you're getting very high recall. I've seen some results of it, but because they weren't my own results, I can't share them just yet. But like the reason like I'm like breaking all my talking protocols and talking about it ahead of the slide is because like, I think it's really cool and exciting. And 
I think it's going to be something that, you know, at, at least, you know, at least for the time being could be, you know, unique to PG vector. And again, the beauty of Postgres, you have multi-column indexes, you can define custom multi-column indexes, you have, you know, and if all else fails, and you need something like, you know, you know, partial indexes or partitioning, like it's there. So uh, real quick, so, you know, I, you know, I shared this slide, you know, hardware selection matters um, briefly, like I compare Graviton 2s to Graviton 3s in this experiment. And it wasn't that just the Graviton 3s are faster, like we expect them to be faster, but particularly as we stress the workload and started doing things that involve more CPU, particularly higher values of EF search, where you have to compare, you know, more vectors to each other. You know, we really, you know, we really saw a speed up with that. Um, you know, beyond just you know the the stock speed up you would get from Graviton uh, going from the the twos to the threes, so it matters, right? If you see, you know, you might be able to squeeze out some extra performance by upgrading your your infrastructure. So real quick, looking ahead, um, I mentioned uh, I would ignore that you know that uh, that date, but it seems like it's trending that way. Um, Parallel builds for HNSW. We're committed. It was actually committed while <laughs> before I wrote these slides. It's like, oh, it's coming soon. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, and then HQ and AN, HQ and AN I mentioned. So finding more ways to pre-filter your, your data on the where clause. Uh, there's more data types. There's actually a patch committed. And this gets into like, can I index values that are you know, greater than 2,000 dimensions? Or can I, you know, can I store values in plain format greater than 2,000 dimensions? Yes, you can if they're smaller. So being able to support, you know, float twos or UN dates, you know, which we, which we see come up. Um, again, if you're machine learning or, you know, you know, wh whatever, uh, you know, vector generation method you're using already like spits out float twos, great. Like this, this is gonna work just great for you. But if you're going from a float four to a float two, you may lose information. So, you know, check with your, uh, your data scientist before, you, you know, you start, you know, uh, reducing your data types. There is a popular technique um, this is implemented in a bunch of different systems, uh, quantization. There's product quantization and scalar quantization. Scale quantization is actually what I, similar to what I just described, is like I might take a float four and map it to a UN date. The idea being that I'm going to retain some information, but I, you know, I might lose a little bit. I might lose a little bit of recall in that way. You know, it's not going to be you know, super dramatic, but it's there. Then you have product quantization, which I think is like a wild technique, but it works well. It's like, hey, how do I take like a 128 dimensional vector and then map it effectively to an eight dimensional vector that points to like a bunch of different, you know, you know centers off in space. A very effective technique at reducing the, the size of a vector, but it does impact recall. Originally, we actually had those higher up on the PG vector roadmap. And again, when I say roadmap, it's an open source project. So, you know, it, you know it's roadmap as is, uh, you know, anything in open source, but, you know, as we saw more people using PG vector, you know, we leaned, you know, you know, we leaned in on more on like the active problems, like getting HNSW into PG vector, uh, you know, supporting, you know, working to support, uh, you know, enhanced filtering. So I think you know quantization will happen. Uh, you know, I, I think you know it's a matter, it's a matter of when. Again, I think I, for some reason this is Q1 2024. I don't know where that came from, but. Yeah, I think it's it's likely to be next on the list after you know we handle these things, and then parallel query, which interestingly I think HNSW has really helped with eliminating some need for parallel query. Again, I think as we see larger HNSW indexes, you know it might um, we might need it more. But I've seen you know I've seen um, HNSW on let's say you know one billion you know one billion records. Like literally, I mean, first off, I wouldn't have done it the way that the test was done, which is we put a billion vectors into a single Postgres table and then put an HNSW index on top of that table. I mean, normally you would first partition that table before you do it, but we were seeing like we were seeing really good, uh, you know, uh, queries per second on this, you know, billion records in a single Postgres table. And I don't think I'm allowed to share what those numbers are that, you know, right now, but there, uh, you know, once I run my own independent test on it, I can I can share something on it. But like, it, it's super fast. Like, I was shocked how fast it was. So I think you know to conclude, as I know I'm a little bit over time. Um, when you're looking, you know, so, you know, this is actually general guidance. You know, this goes beyond just PG vector, but I think it's important because the first thing, and again, as you know, as a recovering app developer. The thing that I didn't fully really understand was recall coming into this, and the idea that I might be getting results that I don't expect, because that's what it is. Like I'm getting unexpected results. Like it's not the exact results, and that's going to always be the design decision. Which is, I got to choose between performance and recall. And HNSW is a little bit magical that it makes that decision a little bit less dire than some of the other algorithms because you can get both and you can get both pretty well, but 
there are going to be decisions that might help impact it, like how much time do I want to spend, you know, building the indexes. And then you also decide like what you want to spend on. Is it storage? Is it compute? Is it your indexing strategy? And you know that you know, you know th these become very practical considerations as you're building out these things. And the last thing, and you know, I think you know, Andy, you know, when I was looking through a lot of the other talks in, in the seminar, you know, I saw I saw this as well, is that everything in this space is rapidly evolving. And even though we have like 20 years of research on how to like how to you know, store and process vectors, I mean that's new by computer science standards. You know, 20, 20 years is nothing. Like Postgres is almost 40 years of research on it. Relational databases have, I don't know. I, I saw your talk in New York. I should I should know that answer off the top of my head. But a, 60. a, a lot of research. 60. There we go. <laughs> so <laughs> and I, I see the death stare on that one. But the you know, what's interesting is like, this is still a new field. It's rapidly evolving. And the interesting thing too, is that people are making decisions today about how to go into production at the same time, while, you know, things three months from now may be very different. I mean, if you look at PG Vector back in February, you know, and, you know, you saw some of the public you know, performance numbers on it, you would be like, why would I ever adopt this? I mean, yeah, it's in Postgres, but, you know, it needs work. But guess what? Work has been done, as they say, and you know PG Vector is you know super quick now. It has a lot of you know modern you know you know modern mechanisms in it, and it's you know I would say and arguably it's innovating. It's adding it's adding new things you know not every day, but you know very rapidly. And you know it you know I would say it's mature. I know people running it in production, um, and it's it's on Postgres, and Postgres is a you know very mature database system. So it's a little bit, you know, if you if you're looking to bring a vector storage system into into what you're doing today, it, there is a bit of plan for day plan and plan for tomorrow. You know, choose something that you're going to be comfortable running. Know that this is the space is going to keep changing and evolving. HNSW does appear to be a winner, but like they, I I know there's going to continue being work on it. You know, HQANN is a good example of that. So with that, um, I conclude, and this is the this is the thank you slide. Awesome. So I will clap on behalf of, of everyone else. Uh, we're over time, so we have one question for Victor if, if they want to go for it. Yeah, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, two, two questions, actually. Number one, is, is there any benefit running PG Vector on GPU? So this has not been tested yet, but I'll, I'll discuss the challenge of GPU, particularly with databases. Um, well, first, if you're interested, if you're interested in this topic, there is a Postgres extension called PG Storm, which is designed to run workloads on GPU. The problem with GPU and databases is getting the data to the GPU and that you need to make sure you have the appropriate bus available to be able to get that data both from you know, memory to GPU, back into memory, back into disk, you know, et cetera. You know, you know, the, that path is optimized for getting to CPU, um, you know, particularly you know, you know, as we know it for databases. For GPU, you need to be on the appropriate hardware and that hardware does exist. But then, you know, beyond that, then you need to be able to to have you know, PG Vector, Postgres, et cetera, work with the GPU as well. And again, there are there is an extension that does that today, PG Strom. And you know, if that's something you're interested in, you know, definitely you know, dive into that. Um, the the biggest I'd say, you know, to date, the biggest challenges with PG Vector have not been processing related. They have been data related in the sense that you know, for a while, PG Vector was memory bound. That's where you were seeing the, you know, a lot of the performance results are on IVF5 because basically you're pulling like a ton of these pages into memory. And if you're on a memory constrained system, you're swapping them in and out. HNSW does alleviate that, you know, quite a bit based upon its different search path. But again, like a lot of this data, you know, particularly when you're doing these searches is gonna be more memory bound than CPU bound, particularly if you're only looking out for like a smaller set of your data. One thing we've been able to do with HNSW really well is like we've like pushed it to like high levels of concurrency, and we've seen PG Vector and Postgres scale pretty close to linearly up to like you know a, pre a pretty high number of cores, because in a lot of these searches, particularly for a lower EF search, you're not making that many comparisons, so you're not using that much CPU. So you just have the classic database problem of being able to pull information you know in and out of memory, in and out of disk. As you scale up and you you start getting you know as you start getting more cores involved or you you know you increase your EF search you you do start stressing the CPU more, and that's where a GPU could ultimately kick in. But again, I haven't seen enough data. I, I, you know, I don't think we fully pushed the CPU far enough yet where we would necessarily see the the benefit of a GPU. Now, a year from now, I think it might be a different story. You know, particularly as we get better with the you know the, just the general processing of of this data. But right now, I would say there's still there's still some headroom, you know, both on CPU utilization and how we can how we can uh, you know actually traverse the information. Oh.
Oh, so I think I already answered, sort of answered my second question. What difficulty you have uh, for C to support running a GPU? So basically, I think if I understand correctly, you're basically saying it's because the way GPU is being used is kind of accelerated with CPU. That's why uh, getting data back and forth is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, just to maybe to close that thought out, I think the biggest benefit of GPU today would be on the, excuse me, the index building, not the searching. Because the building is where most of the time is spent, particularly for HNSW. And again, for IVA flat, the, most of the time is spent on the, on the search, actually. But for, for HNSW, I think there could be a benefit of GPU. Um, and that's if, if that would be an area to invest in using GPU, well, I, I would pick that one. I, I still think there's headroom for how we can you know, effectively use the CPU based upon what I've seen.